Um, and yes, I'm Gert, and I will be talking about the model that I'm working on as an industrial PhD project with Ecofone and uh, DTU. Um, yes, so first, now we've heard about a bit about uh, geometrical models, and then I will just briefly go through why we have chosen to look at these two models and combine them. So first of all, the focus, of course, for Ecofone is they want to be able to model small rooms with porous absorbers because they produce porous absorbers. Um, so in that case, then we need to look at the, the scattering from surfaces and objects. So therefore, we want to be able to model both specular and diffuse reflections. So that's why we've chosen to combine two models. So for the specular reflections, we've chosen to use the image choice model. And uh, that is, as I said, purely specular reflections. Uh, and we've chosen the image choice model because it's uh, possible to uh, use face and angle dependent boundary conditions. Um, and it's deterministic. So, and there's no detection problem. Um, the problem with the image source method, however, is that it's computationally very heavy uh, for higher orders of reflection. Um, yeah. So for uh, the diffuse reflections, we've chosen to use acoustical radiosity. Um, and that has a continuous reflection pattern. Instead of modeling the diffuse reflections as uh, represented by a single direction, then this has a con continuous pattern. Um, it's also computationally efficient for high orders of reflection, which is an advantage, especially when we have the, the image choice method, on the other hand, which is com computationally heavy for high orders of reflection. Um, acoustical radi radiosity is, however, energy-based. Um, yeah. So um, what uh, combined models have been developed at DTU? So the first one was uh, Charism, um, which has an adaptive termination of the image source methods, which I'll get back to, which is a bit this about how, how do we have a computational uh, efficient method but without losing too much precision. Um, the Charism model is energy-based and uses angle-independent um, absorption coefficients to describe the surfaces. So uh, that's why we wanted to then uh, develop this into person, which is uh, as very much the same as Charism, so it has the adaptive termination of the image choices. But now we have angle-dependent boundary conditions and phase boundary conditions in the image source method. So um, because acoustical radiosity is an energy-based method, then we need to find a way to uh, reconstruct a pressure impulse response from that part of the model. So uh, just a bit about the adaptive termination of the image sources and why we want to do that. Um, we, want to ha we don't want to have a fixed order of termination for uh, the image sources. So we have a scheme where um, every time something for each order reflection, something is absorbed, something is specularly reflected, and something is uh, diffusely reflected. Then at the, uh, the last order of reflection for this family of image sources, then as you can see, the scattering coefficient for the, the diffuse uh, contribution is uh, assumed to be 1. So all energy is sent to, uh, to acoustical radiosity, and there is no contribution to, uh, to a new image source method. Uh, this termination is um, then dependent on the, the strength of the image source. Um, so that means if we look at, um, at uh, calculation efficiency, that you can see here we have the example where uh, the, the scattering coefficient is zero. So this is pure image source method. And then for a higher order reflection, we get and a very increasing um, calculation time. But then we have an increasing scattering coefficient. So down here is the scattering coefficient of 1. So pure acoustic curiosity, which has a constant uh, calculation time for each order reflection. And then you can see these are then intermediate cases. And then when the image sources are beginning to be terminated, then, then the calculation time goes down for orders of reflection. This means that we can um, detect, still detect flutter echoes because some particular families of image sources will survive if they don't hit any uh, very absorbing um, surfaces. 
So then a bit about the scattering pattern of vacuous degree radiosity. Uh, and we're looking at this a bit because we want to figure out a way to reconstruct uh, the pressure impulse response from acoustical radiosity. So we assume that the, we, that the scattering pattern follows uh, Lambert's law, so a cosine pattern. And we then assume this to be true on average. And what I mean by that is that if we have normally equal rooms with different scattering patterns, because we assume this cosine pattern to be true for all diffuse reflections, but we don't know the scattering pattern could look, these are just random examples, but they could look in any way. Um, so if we then look at this um, in a more stochastic way, so we say that the, what we, the result that we get from acoustical radiosity is an ensemble mean of all of these possible rooms that have all possible um, scattering patterns. This then leads us to uh, the pressure impulse response from acoustic radiosity. And acoustic radiosity calculates the energy density at the receiver. Um, this is then done in, energy, in octave bands. And then the impulse response from a single octave band is then determined by, we have here the, the, energy, uh, the energy density impulse response, which is then used as the envelope of the pressure impulse response. So we have here uh, a noise signal. And then we use um, an impulse response of uh, the octave band filter uh, to convolve with them, with this part. So we can then add the, the different, um, so we, in the end, sum the, the impulse responses of all of the frequency bands. So this will, of course, every time this implementation is uh, realized, then we have a new noise signal, which is random. So if we want to avoid this randomness in the realizations, then we can calculate an expect expectation value of the ensemble. And then you can see when this is done, then we don't have the noise signal anymore. So this is, uh, this is without the randomness that is in the, in the noise signal. So let's just look at an example. And this is uh, based on some measurements done at the Echophone Laboratories. So it's an empty classroom with a porous absorber ceiling. We have a source and six receivers. And in the model, it has been modeled with only six surfaces, and this is very related to what Peter Svensson just said, that it's difficult to obtain uh, the correct input data. So we don't know the exact uh, absorption coefficients of these surfaces. We don't know the exact scattering coefficient either. We're guessing that it's 0 0.05. And then for the walls and the floor, um, the absorption coefficient, so here we just use, for the walls and floors, we just use real and angle independent um, absorption coefficient, and those are estimated based on reverberation times done in the room without an absorbing ceiling installed. And then we also have here just the random incidence absorption coefficient. Oh, and then there's something missing. Um, but the random incidence absorption coefficients are... Um, are based on um, on calculations using the porous uh, the the flow resistivity of the porous um, absorber using Komatsu's model. Because as you said, if I call Echophone and ask for uh, an angle in, in an angle dependent impedance, then I'm going to have to wait for a very long time. So we here use the flow resistivity uh, to calculate um, then the impedance of the ceiling. And then we also do some simulations using the random incidence absorption coefficient just to see how these, uh, these two compare. So these are just some uh, examples just to show you how the impulse responses that we get in the end, what they look like, so the total impulse response. And then we have the, the image source method impulse response and the acoustical radiosity impulse response. And as you can see, then the image source method dominates in the beginning of the impulse response. And then the acoustical radiosity yeah, has uh, more and more influence. Um, and of course, this is just a single realization. As I said, if we repeat this, then we'll get um, a slightly different, uh, different response. So um, these are the results in terms of uh, reverberation time and early decay time. And we have the measurement, the comparison with, uh, with the complex and angle-dependent uh, reflection coefficient and then parison with the random incidence absorption coefficient. And as you can see, then the reverberation time 
matches quite well. Um, but then when looking at the early decay time, first of all, then there's of course a bigger difference between the two versions. And it seems that especially at higher frequencies, we don't quite match with the full model. We don't quite match the, um, the measurement results. So how come can that be? So one thing is, as I mentioned, then the scattering coefficient, we're just guessing uh, that it's 0 0.05. We know it's an empty room, so there's probably not that much scattering. But that also means that it's a very difficult case to, uh, to match. So here I've shown the decay curves for uh, 500 hertz and 1 kilohertz. Um, using the scattering coefficient of 0 0.05, as I showed you before, and then uh, increasing the scattering coefficient to 0 0.1. And this is just looking at the first 10 dB, which is what determines the early decay time. Um, and as you can see, then using the higher scattering coefficient gives a much better match with the measurement. So that indicates that we need to know more about the scattering coefficient in order to be able to, um, to model this room correctly. So then just a bit about um, the stochastic nature of this model. Um, because we assume that acoustic radiosity should be seen more as a stochastic model, um, then I hear, so the results you saw before were based on the ensemble mean of the, um, of the impulse response. And here I've shown you um, different realizations uh, for the low frequencies. And as you can see, then we have the ensemble mean here in red, and then five different realizations. And they're sort of a bit around, of course, the ensemble mean as they should be. And some of them actually match the, um, the measured decay curve a bit better. So that indicates that there could be some truth in that, yeah, that the stochastic, or that the, yeah, the stochastic uh, pressure impulse response is not less correct than the the uh, the energy impulse response. Yes. So this is just to show you um, uh, the what this looks like more in frequency domain. And here I've done some comparison between a finite element model and the image source model, uh, just to look at how, because it's um, in finite element, it's not straightforward to incorporate scattering in the way that we do in geometrical modeling. Um, so here I just I only have um, the image source method, and as you can see, then it matches quite well when we use the full image source method. But if we use the image source method with uh, the random incidence absorption coefficient, then we're not at all able to match the modes at, at very low frequencies. Um, and then just to show you what happens then if we have uh, the full Paris model, so we, if we introduce some scattering, then here we just have a very low scattering, and then we have a one where one of the walls has uh, quite high scattering, so it's so the modes still match quite well. But the higher the scattering, the the you can see the peaks don't get quite as high. So the individual modes have less of an influence in this room when we have more scattering. Yeah. So um, just a bit of um, to finish some things that we're considering, um, because right now, especially what has shown to be difficult is to have proper scatter scattering information. Um, so what if we have an angle dependence of the scattering coefficient? And here I'm not so much talking in terms of diffusion coefficient where we want to, to have the actual uh, diffusion pattern, but more if we say that we keep, we, keep the same, we keep the same cosine pattern, but for different angles of incidence, especially if a scatterer has a certain direction, then for different angles of incidence, especially in the azimuth angle, um, then more or less should be scattered, but still in this, uh, this cosine pattern. So we still have the more stochastic approach to it, so not, we don't want to know the exact diffusion pattern, uh, but just more know how much uh, should be diffusely reflected. So another thing is if we have um, scattering from objects, then if the objects are Situated again, we look at this in a more stochastic way. So we say we have a box, and within this box, we know that these um, the that some objects are present. We don't know exactly where they are within this box because if you, for instance, have a classroom, people are going to move the furniture around, put things on the table. Um, but then, is it then more correct to have the scattering as taking place on the surface, or should it take place rather 
in the volume. So right now we're uh, trying to see if we can find a way to incorporate this as something that happens in the volume and not just on the surface. So just to summarize, we want to model the small rooms with the soapy ceiling. So we've combined the image source model with the acoustic curiosity, uh, including adaptive termination of the image source production. And we have phase and angle dependent <coughs> boundary conditions. And we regard acoustic curiosity in a more stochastic way to um, reconstruct the pressure impulse response. And then just the question is how do we obtain good descriptions of the scattering? So should the scattering coefficients be angle dependent? And should the scattering take place more in the volume rather than on the surfaces? So that's all. Thank you for your attention. Any questions?